Authorities have been trying to cope with a major rainstorm on Sunday, playing havoc with traffic on travel and travel across the province. It blew in over the provincial capital, Guangzhou, in early morning. City officials issued a stern warning to residents about its potential impact. And in just a seven-hour period, precipitation in some areas exceeded 400 millimeters. Infrastructure and buildings have been damaged, while there have also been some landslides. No injuries have been reported yet, but the forecast is for more rain across the region. Good evening, thank you for joining us. The mayors of both Montreal and Laval have declared states of emergency. The number of flooded homes and evacuations has increased again, and the need for help from the military has grown. Today, the Canadian Armed Forces said it will triple the number of troops in the province who will be on the ground in flood zones, helping where they can. Our coverage begins tonight with Rob Lurie. In Oka, City Hall is flooded, and the town's pumping station is no longer working. 3,000 residents could soon be forced to leave. In Laval, at least 150 homes now have water damage. And in Pierrefonds, 175 homes are now flooded because last night three dikes were washed out after the water rose by another 10 centimeters. The now familiar refrain here is once again, we've never seen anything like it. The water on this street is higher than five feet in some parts, and it keeps coming. It comes from here, it comes from the Rue Deauville there, it's coming from the, the back of the, the house. So what can you do? Several towns have now declared a state of emergency, and for the first time since the ice storm, now the mayor of Montreal has as well, meaning officials can now force flood victims to leave their homes. People are very, very tired. We're talking about 24 hours in a row. Everybody is, you know, uh, helping each other, but sometimes we need to protect people against themselves. You guys going to do the first section, okay? So I need you ready. Soldiers are in the streets fighting the floods. They're here to help out city workers in any way they can. Originally, there were supposed to be 400 soldiers in Quebec. Now, 1,200 are on the ground. We could use all the help we can get, says this woman whose home is flooded. I'm glad to hate to be here, so I'm not, I'm not helping her right now, but if some people need help, I'll be there for, uh, to help them for sure. But even the army has challenges dealing with all this. In some places, no matter how many sandbags they put out, the water keeps going over them. 
Often, by the time the soldiers arrive, they find that much of the work has already been done by the local blue collar workers and firefighters. But with water levels rising by the hour, there's no shortage of work to do. We're all worried, she says. We've all lost so much and it's not over. I hope the army can help. Trouble is, there's only so much they can do. Earlier today, the army was on this street trying to fix a dike that breached, but they had to leave because the water was coming in so fast that it was even too high for them. It's nature, like you can't always win against it, so. And with water levels expected to rise another 20 centimeters by tomorrow, the question on everyone's mind yet again is, when will this all end? Rob Lurie, CTV News. It just kind of tires you out. Uh, you, you, you move around, get one window fixed, and then the next window gets full of water. Other than that, what can we do? Might as well keep smiling. Il y a bien du monde qui sont partis à Carrier, là, fait qu'ils sont revenus comme en larmes, là, quasiment, là, pour. Fait que j'ai les ai ramenés chez eux pour ça, chercher leur stuff, là. On vient aider les civils tout simplement à créer des, des, euh, des murs de sacs de sable pour empêcher l'eau de rentrer à l'intérieur de leur maison. Le plus possible, et limiter les dégâts autant que possible. Canada's federal government has been deploying troops to flooded areas in Quebec for three days now, with more to come. They're supporting local efforts to build sandbag barriers and help residents forced to flee. Very stressing, very bad, but it's the nature. We have no choice. More than 1,500 homes have already been evacuated. Two people, a 37-year-old man, a two-year-old child, are missing after their car was swept away. As the relief effort intensifies, some areas are facing mandatory evacuation orders. We understand that your house is your most prized possession, but at the same time, uh, the message is your life is the most prized possession. Heavy spring rains and melting snow caused these floods across eastern Canada and most rivers have yet to crest. Many in the hardest hit areas in Quebec say the authorities should have been more prepared for what's being described as the worst flooding in decades. We don't have enough help. I don't know where the army is. So I don't know what else to say. It's a disaster. In the mountains of British Columbia in western Canada, the rain and rising waters have triggered landslides. There's also heavy flooding in lakefront and riverside neighborhoods. Two men are missing, including a local fire chief who was swept away while checking water levels along a local river. The heavy rains of the past five days are easing, giving rescuers a chance to reach remote areas. It's also a chance for the authorities to begin planning a cleanup operation that will likely take many months. Daniel Lack, Al Jazeera. West Mims wildfire in the Okefenokee Swamp has now burned more than 140,000 acres. FEMA has just authorized the use of federal funds to help battle this blaze, and a burn ban has been issued in St. Johns County as well. So now every county in Northeast Florida is under some type of burn ban. In St. George, Georgia, dozens of families are out of their homes still. The fire, which has now been burning for more than a month, is a quarter of the size of Duval County. That's huge. And there's good news for firefighters. Officials say a very large air tanker is on the way to help them out. Really working to fight this fire, and it's easier for them to do that when they don't have to worry about protecting the lives that are in there as well. It's erratic. It is very erratic. The fire's um, got a lot of really erratic behavior. It's, it's still very active right now, and um, a bigger, the biggest problem we've had has been the wind. 
Authorities have ordered evacuations in a vast wildfire burning in southeast Georgia along the Florida border. Officials evacuated about 80 people from the St. George community in Georgia's Charlton County. The West Mims fire has already consumed around 130,000 acres. Dry conditions and gusty winds have added to the danger. Lightning sparked the fire on April 6th in the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge in Georgia. The terrain is rough and swampy, making it hard to contain the flames. A Charlton County official urged evacuated residents to prepare for an extended stay away from home. Whoever yeah. call climate change a hoax? Well, I might have because President Donald Trump has long been skeptical climate change exists. This week, he might do something about it. The landmark Paris Climate Agreement was signed in 2015, a deal that would drastically reduce greenhouse gases. On Monday, a follow-up UN climate meeting gets underway in Bonn, leaving many nations particularly worried it could be used as an opportunity for Trump to begin a withdrawal from the Paris Accord. God bless the USA. As recently as two weeks ago, at a rally commemorating his 100 days in office, Trump said the Paris Agreement would hurt the U.S. economy. On top of all of that, it's estimated that full compliance with the agreement could ultimately shrink America's GDP by $2.5 trillion over a 10-year period. That means factories and plants closing all over our country. Here we go again. Not with me, folks. Small island nations in the South Pacific, many of whom have seen water levels rise in recent years, say for them climate change is a matter of survival. But with the U.S. and more than 190 other countries signed on to the Paris Accord, it's unclear what legal means Trump could find to get out of it. Legally, he can't. Uh, and politically, it would be a disaster. And diplomatically, it would be a disaster. The whole world would put the U.S. as a pariah. It's expected early this week Trump administration officials will be huddling at the White House to determine what position they'll be taking on the Paris Climate Accord. Will they find a legal loophole to get out of it or leave it in place but not implement it? Soon the world should find out if the fight against climate change will include America or not. Gabriel Elizondo, Al Jazeera, Washington. Have a look at this beast of a storm in the southern hemisphere. This is uh, northeast of Australia, tropical cyclone Donna. And, uh, you know, at one point this thing was the equivalent of a Category 4 uh, hurricane. So you got some really, really strong wind, especially very close to the center of it. Now, luckily, the center of this storm has not really uh, directly impacted too many places. There were um, some of the northern islands in Vanuatu that at least were affected by the storm with some heavy rain and some strong wind. New Caledonia, by the way, this is a uh, place that just got hit by a really nasty cyclone a couple of weeks ago, Cyclone Cook. And uh, the good news here is that it appears right now that Tropical Cyclone Donna, at least the center of it, is going to move a little bit to the east of uh, New Caledonia. Let me just zoom in a little bit there. You can see that kind of long island there. That's New Caledonia. Now, of course, the cone of uncertainty is basically telling you where the center of the storm could go. So say the center of the storm kind of ends up on the west side of the cone here, you know, you're still going to have a lot of rain there. And, and, you know, considering the situation that they just got hit by a cyclone not long ago and they had a lot of flooding issues, um, I would say if we do end up with a lot of rain there, which is certainly a possibility, especially in the southern part of the island, we could have some flooding issues. In the middle of Somaliland's harsh, semi-arid Banada region in the east, worsened by a three-year drought, with nothing else in sight for kilometers on end, 
Sophia Shire and her neighbors wait for food aid and water from another far-off village. Only three families have been left here. The rest fled into towns after all their animals died. One of Sophia's remaining camels is dying. She had 50. Now there are only five. The camels she's lost are worth at least 45,000 US dollars on the local market. I considered myself wealthy. Now I'm unable to move my weak animals to another place. We have no option but to wait and watch them die. The nearest water source is an hour's drive away. Sometimes water is trucked to remote villages by the government or aid agencies. Other times people have to walk here to fetch it. This is the only source of water for several hundred people who live around here. All the other wells have dried up because of the drought. The water looks dirty and green and it also has a bit of a smell. Sarah Jama's one-year-old baby has just died from severe diarrhea and vomiting. They came to this hospital from a village about 200 kilometers away and Sarah is also sick. Doctors say they've been drinking contaminated water. She's too traumatized to talk to us. The dead child and mother got sick while we were in the village. We are rural people and know nothing about the disease. But it was God's will. We first saw some rashes on his lips. He had the same symptoms as his mother. It's now raining in parts of Somaliland, but the rain came late and is sporadic. Those who live here tell us they are yet to see much of it. They've already lost 80% of their livestock. Another failed season will devastate what little of their livelihood that remains. Catherine Soy, Al Jazeera, Somaliland.